<clears throat> okay, dear ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you, dear guests, participants, friends. Welcome to the full Central Asian Research Forum on Sustainable Development Innovation 2021. My name is Daniel Medvedev, and please let me introduce my co-moderator, Sherik Shakarim, General Director, CSTARS Kazakhstan. I'm Doctor of Research at Handy Business School, the University of Reading, and Head of the Innovation Team at um, KPA UK. Well, the forum is a multidisciplinary research event which provides a platform for design, discussion, implementation of research-backed and action-oriented privileges with a focus on the needs of Central Asian region. Dear ladies and gentlemen, please let me introduce you with the agenda. We'll be having three mini sessions. Session number one, we'll be having welcome speeches from our guests. Session number two, there will be a brainstorming session. There are two main questions that hopefully we'll be finding answers for. And the last session, session number three, what we call follow-up. Let me remind you that at the end of the session, we're expecting to have an outcome as the report, a draft report of the final statements that we'll be um, discussing through the whole Right. Please let me give the floor to the welcome speech to Ms. Alia Selbaeva, who is the president of the Kazakhstan PhD Association in the UK. Alia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alia. Good morning, UK. Good evening, Kazakhstan. And hello to all our attendees all over the world. Welcome to our fourth Central Asian Research Forum on Sustainable Development and Innovation. We are today in Almaty. Uh, we have our distinguished uh, speakers in Musulta, we have our ambassador in London, and our partner, Lavbury University at Lavbury. Uh, it is early morning in the US and late evening in Australia, but we are recording this session and uh, with a simultaneous translation to Russian or Kazakh, so our colleagues can join and um, learn our key messages after. First of all, let me thank our general sponsor, Nushultan Zerbaya Foundation, and our ambassador and mentor for helping us to organize this event. Thank you very much to all our partners for making their large contributions for making this event happen together with us. This year, we are focused on creating a joint mechanism of the forum development that will meet the goals of our partners, as well as the development institutions that we hope will become our close friends and partners to find joint solutions to achieve SDGs through research and development, training and education, as well as corporate innovation. Uh, let me briefly introduce us. The Kazakhstan PhD Association in the UK is the largest association of Kazakhstani scientists abroad, which has been established in November 2017, aiming to facilitate the interaction of scientists as well as foster the implementation of the best practices in the field of innovation, science, and uh, sustainable development with a focus on the needs of Kazakhstan and Central Asian regions. We cover and include PhD graduates and students, uh, mostly uh, from the UK, but also uh, cover our researchers uh, in the US, uh, Canada, Australia, and Hong Kong. Uh, next one, please. Uh, our focus areas uh, include innovation. The head of innovation team is Dania Mediata, who is not great in the session today. Dania is PhD researcher in entrepreneurship and has a business school and certified tracker urban team. We also have a head of this team today who is Matina Jamusava. She did her PhD at Carleton University in public policy. Uh, we have also ecology and mining teams. Uh, one of the experts, uh, Gami, uh, who is PhD in hydrogeology. Also with us today, and also we have our guest, Adrian Kompetov, who is leader of water management resources team. Uh, 
we co uh, we cover mostly in this so uh, in these teams renewable energy production for local use, recycling, agricultural, industrial, and domestic waste, digital technologies to efficient use of water and other natural resources. Our mining team has three focus areas: uh, water management, health and safety, and byproducts recovery. We also have Kazakh language team, which is aimed to disseminate knowledge to regions on native language and thus promoting equality. Our economics team is currently focused on translating economics book to Kazakh and also educating people in the regions of Kazakhstan. Our IT team, we also have IT team. The head of this team is Asira Jalava, who is with us today. She got her PhD in IT at King's College University. Asir is also head of international project department at KBTU. And this team is currently focusing on a project proposal in artificial intelligence. Our, uh, next one, please. Our interests uh, mainly include research and development, uh, education track, and corporate innovations. Thus, today's session is devoted to partnership and cooperation to find potential joint win win uh, strategic mechanism for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elia. Thank you for your kind and clear um, presentation of the association. Um, well, the next speech, the next welcome speech, we're expecting. Um, his Excellency um, Ilani Trisov, who is Ambassador of Kazakhstan in the UK and mentor of the Association. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, good afternoon in Kazakhstan. I'm uh, very pleased that we have this event in a hybrid format. We come here. I have unmuted myself. Uh, do you hear me now? You hear me well, right? Uh, I have uh, for the second time, so some hear me, some not hear me. Do not hear me. No, we can't hear. Maybe you don't want to hear me. <laughs> We're trying to fix it. <laughs> please do, please do. Uh, on my end, is everything is okay. My uh, my device shows that it is unmuted. And uh, do we do we see me? Aliyah, do you see me? Ah. Okay, maybe someone else will step in uh, while I'm uh, being unmuted by others. Uh, on a selective basis. <laughs> it's, a, it's a discrimination against the ambassador. What's on the other side? Do you hear me or not? Here. I uh, suggest that you keep going. No, can no, you hear, you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. So uh, uh, let me start with the protest, diplomatic protest. Uh, I can see that uh, the organizers and the hosts wanted to discriminate ambassadors and diplomats. <laughs> of course, this is a joke. Uh, but uh, once again, uh, good morning to everyone. I'm very happy. Uh, to be part of this uh, very important event. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, we are able to do this in a hybrid format. Uh, I can see quite a powerful group over there in the uh, uh, Kazakh British Technical University uh, masking themselves. Some are masking, some are not masking. Uh, so I don't, I'm, I don't know. What is the pattern there? Who is taking masks and who is not taking masks? Uh, but anyway, I'm very glad to see uh, all my friends and I'd like to uh, thank particularly uh, all our stakeholders, new stakeholders who take part uh, in this event. I particularly want to commend uh, uh, the uh, international uh, partners. Uh, thank you for responding to my letter to you. I can, uh, uh, I, I want to thank, of course, the British Council, Lori, I can see Lori there. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, EBRD, uh, Asian Bank, Development Bank, UNICEF, um, 
uh, Seed Stars, uh, Lovebury University, and so many others. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, responded to my call, to our call, uh, to my young uh, 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 doctors, uh, as I'm uh, being called a mentor. I, I, I'm very happy to be a mentor, but uh, I'm very happy that uh, you have picked up the call and uh, we are together here today uh, for the fourth uh, annual uh, uh, science forum, uh, uh, which we uh, very ambitiously call uh, Central Asia uh, Science Forum. Of course, the focus is uh, on Kazakhstan and uh, the origin comes uh, from the PhD Association from Kazakhstan, and I'm very happy. Uh, I would like to welcome our Central Asian friends uh, who uh, are taking part in this event, uh, particularly on the participation uh, uh, side, not on the panel side. Uh, and want to say that uh, it is very timely to, uh, this year because this year happens to be the year of the 30th anniversary uh, of uh, actually all uh, Central Asian countries and Kazakhstan uh, as they became independent. And it is absolutely uh, an important turning point uh, when uh, uh, people usually not only uh, look back and assess what they have done, but uh, most importantly, they try to look into the future. And uh, the young generation uh, is uh, a very important tool which enables us uh, to look into the future. Another important uh, 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 milestone is uh, exactly the building where, where you are sitting. You are sitting in the building of the Kazakh British Technical University. I can see my good friend Kenjibek uh, Ibrashov on the other, on the other side. Kenjibek, hello. Uh, this is a historic building. This is the building uh, where the first government of Kazakhstan, Kazakh SSR, Kazakh Socialist Republic, uh, was sitting. This is a historic building where many important decisions uh, uh, have uh, been uh, made. And now uh, this is the uh, body uh, which uh, hosts the Kazakh British Technical University, which marks this year the 20th anniversary. I'm uh, the one who was uh, physically and personally witnessing uh, the birth of this university. I was uh, then uh, the foreign minister, our ambassador here uh, uh, was a very powerful uh, educationalist and he was uh, very instrumental in bringing together uh, uh, this uh, agreement. And I remember uh, how uh, President Nazarbayev, our Yelbasse, uh, and the British government uh, were coming uh, to an agreement to establish this university. And I remember uh, British friends were asking, why you want a technical university? Uh, and Nazarbayev insisted that it should be technical because uh, new times are coming and we need new human capital, uh, uh, particularly with a focus on new technologies, uh, future sciences. Therefore, he said, please uh, do help us to develop this important tool for the future. And uh, I uh, think uh, uh, this is uh, coming together today, the 30th anniversary of uh, our independence, the 20th anniversary of the Technical University, the fourth science forum, which is being engined, uh, um, uh, dry, driven by uh, the young uh, generation of Kazakhstan. This is absolutely important and very symbolic. And I commend uh, uh, this opportunity to welcome you all to this important event. We'll have... Uh, uh, five full days uh, uh, of uh, discussions, uh, different panels, different uh, topics, uh, many participants, uh, many ideas will be brainstormed, discussed, and this is exactly uh, what we want to achieve and what we want to see. And of course, uh, uh, I know uh, we, we are in touch with the in preparing this event uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, my team in the embassy is uh, trying to help uh, young uh, doctors of course, important is the follow-up. Uh, they will uh, make the summary of the discussions of uh, those uh, these uh, four days. Uh, and, and then I will try uh, to make sure that they are being uh, followed uh, in the most uh, practical and uh, resultful way. For that matter, I hope that uh, all the international participants from all these organizations which I mentioned Tomorrow we are having a, having a panel with the participation of government agencies who responded also uh, quite powerfully uh, to the call of uh, our PhD uh, association. I hope that uh, this uh, uh, four days of discussions will not be uh, only for the sake of discussions, but uh, for the sake of result. 
for the sake of uh, practical achievements and things uh, which have to take place uh, after the forum uh, till we meet again uh, for the next forum uh, next year. This year, of course, uh, was the most challenging year. Uh, exactly a year ago, the World Health Organization formally uh, a century ago. So that was uh, a call. Uh, everyone was caught unprepared. And uh, we have lived through a very difficult and challenging year. And uh, uh, no year uh, could uh, highlight uh, so much the importance of uh, science and innovation, uh, the importance of uh, human brain uh, in addressing uh, the global challenge. I think uh, uh, that was an absolute uh, uh, clear distinction, uh, which we all uh, understood uh, uh, throughout this year. Another um, uh, strong sim uh, signal which uh, the pandemic year has brought us all, to all of us, was, of course, uh, the focus on uh, health and environment. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, actually, everyone on Earth realized that these are the two most important priorities we have to focus on, health and environment. Therefore, uh, there is such a huge excitement uh, and preparation here in London, where I sit uh, for the uh, COP26 event uh, in November in Glasgow. Therefore, there is so much agitation, there is so much energy in uh, uh, talking about these issues. Uh, scientists even uh, created the word Anthropocene. Uh, this is a new uh, geological era uh, where uh, only uh, the human activity uh, uh, creates uh, so many changes uh, many of them uh, unhealthy changes and influences uh, on our planet, on our life. Uh, and I think uh, this all uh, has brought a clear uh, understanding uh, to everyone that science and innovation, human capital are the tools with which we will be able to address those uh, uh, huge challenges to allow our uh, kids, our grandchildren, future generations to live a decent life. We should not be egoistic, thinking only about ourselves. We have to think about the future life. And uh, this is in our hands. And this is in the hands of young generation, uh, the people like Alia and her, t uh, her colleagues uh, in the uh, uh, very useful uh, uh, PhD association in the United Kingdom, of which I was uh, very happy to be one of the founding uh, contributors. I remember my first meeting with Aliya, uh, my dear Aliya, and uh, I immediately uh, uh, took it as my one of the most important jobs here in London to support uh, uh, Kazakh uh, students and Kazakh uh, uh, doctors uh, studying in UK. Therefore, I'd like to uh, um, um, once again welcome all of you. Uh, I uh, uh, am sure that you notice that uh, the government of Kazakhstan, uh, the new president of Kazakhstan, Yelbase, they always uh, uh, take this uh, very seriously. And there are a number of uh, initiatives uh, which highlight the importance of uh, human capital building. Uh, let me start with the Bolashak. Uh, maybe it uh, is already a cliche uh, to uh, 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 refer to Bolashak, but it's a, it's a very serious, uh, most important uh, uh, independent step of young Kazakhstan in those days uh, to start uh, uh, planting the seeds for the future. That, that, those were the words of uh, Yelbasse uh, when he was defending uh, $10 million uh, 30 years ago for the Bolashak program, where the parliament uh, was not agreeing with uh, uh, Yelbasse, where the parliament was refusing to give him this small amount of money uh, in today's terms. But then uh, $10 million was a huge amount for young Kazakhstan. And he said, we have to think, uh, I remember this very well, this debate. Uh, the deputies, the members of the parliament were uh, against uh, allocating $10 million. Uh, they were saying, why should we uh, uh, provide this money when uh, people on the ground are starving, uh, not getting their salaries and pensions? Why should we uh, waste this money for some young people who will run away to the West and uh, will ne never come back to Kazakhstan? Another wife said, no. We have to be brave, we have to be uh, confident, and we have to trust them 
because we are planting the seeds for the future. These were the words, and he eventually, uh, of course, uh, actually uh, has uh, taken the money from the parliament, and uh, we now have a very successful uh, Bolashak program. So this was one of the first important steps uh, which uh, clearly indicated that uh, Kazakhstan wants to look into the future and invest the money into the young generation. That's exactly what uh, uh, his successor, President Tokayev, is doing. And uh, you, you uh, have seen the establishment of new institutions, uh, the focus of which, uh, be it the National Council for uh, 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 Trust uh, Building, be it the new uh, Supreme Economic uh, uh, Reform Council, all of this uh, have the focus on young generation, all of this have a focus on uh, human capital building. Therefore, I uh, would like to uh, once again commend our uh, PhD association. Uh, um, I uh, would hope that uh, they will continue to thrive and grow. Uh, uh, today, there are more than 100 uh, young uh, scientists, talented, uh, having access to uh, modern sciences uh, in different corners of science, uh, having access to best universities in the United Kingdom and broader. Uh, in other parts, uh, we have uh, uh, PhD uh, doctors uh, from Canada, from the United States, from Australia, I think. So uh, I uh, would hope that uh, uh, particularly our friends and partners from the international organization will come in closer touch with the PhD Association. I would uh, strongly recommend that you sit down and think uh, uh, sort of MOUs between yourself uh, to develop uh, practical programs uh, for your cooperation. You have resources, you are international organization representing the world, and this is a young uh, offspring of Kazakhstan, uh, which uh, is eager uh, and full of energy uh, to work for the future. Therefore, I hope uh, this uh, uh, forum will be uh, a very important um, uh, ground, a garden, uh, where you will uh, be able together to work on the ground, uh, to plant the seeds, uh, uh, for future cooperation. Once again, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, uh, and uh, I wish uh, uh, two uh, uh, very successful coming days uh, in your discussions and uh, deliberations. Thank you very much. And thank you once again for discriminating me at the, at the start. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, um, dear Ambassador. Thank you for your kind and continuous support. Um, we do believe that today's discussion will definitely have an impactful and valuable outcome. And we do believe that the association has been growing in leveraging its expertise. So, and we really believe in a very, very open future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome um, the director of the Catholic British Technical University, uh, Ibrahim of Thank, Thank you. you. Прошу превосходительство, господин посол, уважаемые коллеги, здесь много наших партнеров, партнеров нашего университета, коллег, которые участвуют на четвертом центрально-азиатском научном форуме по устойчивому развитию и инновациям на площадке Казахстанского британского технического университета. Мы всегда рады приветствовать вас в нашем университете. Мы Поддерживаем и будем поддерживать ассоциацию PHD в Великобритании. Пока еще рано говорить о результатах, но мы готовы с вами работать. Я думаю, что результаты придут позже. В целях устойчивого развития, вот в национальном подходе Казахстана, цель номер четыре – это образование. Очень важная и горячая тема для нашей страны. В 2025-2030 году эксперты пророчат успех представителям технических профессий, специалистам в области проектирования управления умными городами, экспертам в области альтернативной энергетики, зеленой энергетики. Мы, конечно, очень обеспокоены вопросами экологии, защиты окружающей среды, особенно экологии Каспи, Каспийского моря. Очень важного водоема для нашей страны. И по большинству этих тем, которые будут обсуждаться на данном форуме, в нашем университете проводится определенная работа как в научных изысканиях, а по некоторым профессиям молодые люди уже сегодня получают образование в стенах Казахстанского и Британского технического университета. 
Я тоже хотел сказать о значимости этого года для нашего университета, о 30-летии независимости Казахстана, о 20-летии нашего университета. Но его происходительство господин посол все уже за меня объяснил. Спасибо вам большое. Мы также уделяем одной другой цели устойчивого развития, это поддержки иностранных студентов, поддержки женщин. Мы работаем с программой развития ООН в Казахстане, с посольствами Исламской Республики Афганистан. Сегодня большая группа афганских женщин проходит обучение КБТУ по программам бакалавриата, магистратуры и дополнительного образования формы ТВЕД. И мы намерены дальше продолжать наше сотрудничество с программой развития ООН и, и, и Афганистаном. Я уверен, что данный форум даст дополнительный стимул для молодежи развивать креативные мышления, навыки в области урбанистики, предпринимательства, защиты окружающей среды и других важных сферах, которые отмечены в целях устойчивого развития Организации Объединенных Наций. Поэтому я хочу пожелать всем участникам успешной плодотворной работы. Пожалуйста, когда нужна поддержка в Алматы, в Казахстане, мы всегда с вами обращайтесь. Спасибо. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, the next welcoming speech will be given by Ms. Mikhaila Freelich Story, a UN Presidential Coordinator, Kazakhstan. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. Thank you so much for having us with you here today. I am very honored to be here and speak today on behalf of the United Nations in Kazakhstan, but I am also humbled to be amongst the distinguished uh, researchers and academia that is with us here. We know, as we have heard, that we are having this meeting, which I understand is annual and the fourth one in a hybrid mode, and we all know why. The pandemic has struck us all very hard, both personally and professionally. It is therefore especially encouraging to see that events like these ones are happening and we will talk about sustainability and innovation because that is what we need. The pandemic has severely hit the progress that we have made on SDGs around the globe and we need innovation, research, new approaches and new ideas to regain what we lost and to move forward. In September 2019, the UN Secretary General called on all sectors of society to mobilize for a decade of action. It was identified on three levels. The first such level he called uh, was a global action to secure greater leadership, more resources and smarter solutions to deliver on the SDGs. The second level he called the local action, embedding the needed transitions in policies, budgets, institutions and regulatory frameworks to make sure that what we decided globally also delivered on the ground. And maybe the third level is in many ways equally, or maybe some would even say more important, it's the people action. It's including youth, civil society, media, academia, to make sure that all women, men, boys and girls that we are delivering the SDGs to are involved. And we know that this has to be a circular economy of ideas and innovation from the people, from the academia, feeding into the local and the global level, and you are key to that. It has becoming clear to us that we cannot do business as usual. The approaches that we have taken in countries 
they have not delivered what we need to do in order to reach the goals of the 2030 agenda. We need to strengthen our partnerships. We need to have this whole of society approach. We need to think new. We need to do new. Basically, we need you. We are trying within the UN system, of course, of course. We have, for example, as recently as the 2nd of March here in Kazakhstan, my colleagues in UNDP officially joined a global network of 92 innovative accelerator labs where they will test and scale new solutions, all based on methods related to sense making, collective intelligence and solutions mapping. We will be presenting this and offering these new ideas to the government of Kazakhstan as we move on. I see that my colleague Arthur van Diesen is here from UNICEF and I hope that he will also be able to share some thoughts and experiences from the UNICEF very innovative engagement on the social innovation lab as well as other ideas. But I also want to mention the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, that has, for example, come up with a program that they call Digi um, that is looking at digitalizing agricultural processes. And this is all based on input that has been received from local farmers. This feeds into the digital Kazakhstan and the greening of Kazakhstan. When we come with these ideas and innovations, as you well know, we must think across all of the 17 SDGs. No SDGs can be reached without having support and impact, and frankly, not always net a positive on the wider scale of development. But during the lockdowns, and now we have been having, we had to engage in new ways. We see how we need stronger digital solutions. We need to work with science, technology and innovations. These are the drivers for change forward. This is where the solutions lie. And as His Excellent, Excellency also said in his opening remarks, when we are fighting the pandemic, we see the proof how research is finding the solutions to the challenges we are facing. I think that we are going to see a global elevation of the importance of research and science because no one can deny what we have been able to deliver over the past year when it comes to, for example, developing vaccines, but also finding solutions for those that are locked at home, for example. Let me then finally say that it is clear to us that none of this can be done alone. Even if the UN is very big and very broad, we know that at the core of what we do is partnerships. We, we, we work with a wide range of partners in various areas. That is how we move forward, be it academia, be it civil society, be it governments, it doesn't matter. Only together can we deliver on the commitments we have made. We need to focus on science, research and innovations. And as I said, we need you. The seeds that were planted many years ago needs to grow up to the trees, as we heard. And you are the forest of new ideas that can bring this forward. But let me also say that it is also essential that we keep planting new seeds. Your ideas will spur the next generation. We all look at you and say that you're young, but quite frankly, we also need even younger engagement. So I look forward to listening to you and learning from you and also hear how we can bring this forward to the next generation, because none of us stay in the youth category forever. So with that, dear colleagues, I am delighted to be here. I wish you very fruitful discussions and I look forward to listening in to you throughout the discussions this, this afternoon. Thank you so much for having us with you today. And thank you very much. Thank you for such an insightful speech. Um, and we are really grateful to know that you need us, but 
what we can say, but we need you as well. And we are ready to share with, with the creative and innovative ideas. And hopefully today is the day when we, we can show that. Thank you. All right, well, this is the end of the session number one. Uh, we're smoothly moving on and starting session number two. Dear ladies and gentlemen, please let me um, share with some procedural information. Um, there are two groups, global perspective, what we call a local perspective. We would love to listen to Dr. Elizabeth Peel from Lockery University and Mr. Eric Laurie, British Council, and their opinion on uh, two main questions from the global perspective. Um, what are the key challenges to the sustainable development of Central Asia? That's the question number one. And question number two, how to ensure the sustainable development through effective management of human resources and innovations? Also, um, let me say that we've got strict time limits. And I will thank you. Thank you. So for each question, um, ladies and gentlemen, you'll be having three minutes to share your own opinion and insights, or perhaps some sort of background information. From the local perspective, we're expecting to listen to Mr. Chinggis Kanapiyanov, GEC Consulting, Mr. Gennady Rao, uh, ADB, Mr. Grigori Sava, EBRD, and Mr. Otto Van Diesen, UNICEF. Shall we start from Dr. Elizabeth Peel from Lowry University? Thank you very much. Um, good, good evening to everybody in Kazakhstan and, and good morning to those of us um, in the UK. Um, I've got um, a, a quick slideshow that I want to share with you all. So I will just, um, I will just share my screen now. Now I'm going to speak to um, the first, first uh, the second of the two questions and I want to to talk a little bit um, about um, the university strategy um, which we're developing which is really focused around creating a sustainable future together and all of those words are absolutely crucial to the conversations that we'll all be having over the next few days and as the ambassador um, said, His Excellency said, the health environment are absolutely crucial um, in that context. Um, and I noticed for those of you at KBTU, I had a very productive meeting in the very room that you're in now. So a very happy 20th birthday to you at, at KBTU. So I just want to, to, to just contextualize um, the university for you. You'll see that we've got two campuses, one in the heart of the Midlands and one in London, which is a purely postgraduate campus. Um, so in the context of the, the Kazakh PhD Student Association, they, they're both um, very um, important places, um, I think. And we have nine academic schools, three of which are skewed to our engineering disciplines, which of course speaks to, to much of the, the, the sustainable emphasis that that you have um, in relation to um, the agendas that you're that you're taking forward um, as you can see here um, we're top 10 in all of the league tables um, within the UK and we very much focus on um, trying to utilize our research to effectively shape public policy and obviously ultimately improve the quality um, of people's lives. I mean fundamentally that's what that's what higher education is all about. And we do that around a number of different key themes um, in our research. So I won't talk through this slide in, in any detail, um, except to say that um, energy is key, health and well-being probably more important now um, than ever before. And I'm going to um, just kind of give you one example of where we are innovating um, at the university. So we've just launched the National Centre in Combustion and Aerothermal Technology. And this is very much a partnership. So um, it comprises um, BAES, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the Aerospace Technology Institute, Innovate UK and support um, from Rolls-Royce. And this um, will really enable industrial um, 
problem um, owners to visit and work very, very closely with world class um, academic researchers um, in this area and create um, new research and innovation, which will um, translate from theory to practice really quickly and as efficiently um, as possible. We're also um, at the university very interested in um, enterprising um, and we have an enterprise network which is all about starting um, and supporting early career researchers um, with their um, spin out companies and really create a vibrant environment to take new ideas forward and they happen across both of our campuses. And here's just a couple of examples of enterprising Loughborough PhD students. And of course, we hope um, if we get back onto the Bolashak list to be supporting more and more Kazakh um, young talent to come to the university. And here's just two examples, one around supporting family carers um, to support their loved ones. And another one which focuses on modelling flooding um, in real time, which is, a, which is a big issue both in the UK, but in all sorts of other parts of the world um, as well. In terms of our connection to Kazakhstan, um, this really started uh, with the visit from the Vice Chancellor and the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research in November 2018. And I won't go through this, um, except to say I had a wonderful um, visit in October 2019, which of course seems like um, a different world um, when we're engaging in this um, hybrid format. Um, and we, of course, hope um, that these these um, connections go from strength to strength. I can see a, I can see a piece of paper. Um, I was asked to talk about um, COVID and how the universities engage with COVID. So I'll, I'll just end on that. We've very much taken a, a community approach. Um, we have a fast lateral flow testing centre at the university um, and we've been processing um, tests in a really quick way. Um, at the moment, the university doesn't have any symptomatic cases at all, um, but a lot of that has been done in conjunction with supporting wellbeing um, and mental health and, and compulsory mm -hmm. testing for our students and encouraging testing for our staff. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was quite interesting to know, especially the enterprise and PhD students. That's really important nowadays, very actual. Um, because most of the PhD students are sort of struggling with the, what we call commercialization or monetization of their projects and research. Um, and scientific projects. Thank you. Um, well, Mr. Eric Lowry, British Consul, um, though, would you like to add? Um, um, sorry, I believe I will interrupt you. Yes, I'm saying Kremlin, I'm seeing stars. And here I'm more focused on the side of the entrepreneurs. Now, I'd like to uh, say that in cooperation with the uh, KP in the UK, uh, we are trying to create this mechanism that will commercialize first the research, but not uh, based on just commercializing it, but tackling the SDGs and uh, creating a mechanism for solving the problems that we have. And here I would like to hear more maybe from Eric on your experience and how, because anyway, all the SDGs are based on the problems that we have. And what would you say that? maybe poor infrastructure. We mentioned lack of roads and electricity, which are all part of SDGs just summarized with certain groups. Maybe you could provide some of your experience uh, or your knowledge how those problems be tackled with essential with researchers. I believe research is the basis of solving uh, and pushing the development of all the countries. Uh, can you hear me? Is that okay? Um, so, uh, morning, afternoon, and good evening, depending on, on, on where you are. Um, I, I hope I will answer um, the bits of your question. Uh, to be honest, uh, the British Council um, is very much focused on education. So, anything I say, I hope, is a provocation uh, around the area of um, education and um, looking at youth as um, a resource that needs to benefit from um, international engagement. I think what I would say is that adding an international dimension to learning and teaching 
opens up minds to a broader range of views and perspectives. When students see, hear, feel, and touch a diverse range of views and opinions, they will be better thinkers, better leaders, better informed, and more able to challenge convincingly. The youth of today are tomorrow's politicians, ec economists, scientists, technology experts, researchers, doctors, etc. I think we can all agree that adding global networks and exposure to international ideas will most likely benefit them personally, but also uh, the country. International engagement brings additional benefits, such as tolerance, respecting difference, be that religious, ethnic, linguistic, and I think what is more likely than not to come across people from vastly different backgrounds. And underpinning uh, all this are the standards and abilities of young people to communicate through English, which is now, as we all know, a truly global language. Without the English language, international engagement is not easy. International engagement can come in a number of ways, at the institutional level, through collaborative research, joint deg degree programs, student exchange, school links, and at an individual level, it might come through having a level of English that allows one to study overseas, the ability to read texts by international authors, to participate in international events, and of course, to be able to postulate for international scholarships. Education should be up to date and relevant. By that, I mean that students graduate uh, with skills required by the job market and what employers are seeking. And by skills, I mean not just subject area knowledge, but also soft skills, how to study, how to plan, how to convene a project team, how to present, how to engage an audience. The English language is a passport to opportunities in the same way as soft skills are. Without it, a nation's youth is at risk of being insular and introverted, which is never a good thing. Idea ideas need to aerate and draw on diverse opinions if they are to be robust and stand up to challenge. I think a challenge for Central Asia is to get its education system on the world map, to be seen as a driver of education development and innovation. This presents an opportunity for Kazakhstan to position itself as a magnet for education in the sub-region and for its neighbors to look to it for an inspiration. In summary, TNE or transnational education has an important role to play in sustainable development. Um, could, could, should I carry on? Yes, yeah. Uh, where education institutions seek to forge alliances and dialogue with international education bodies to establish joint working, there can only be benefits for the youth of tomorrow and a dynamic forward thinking nation. But I would like to finish on one other point. And that is for a country like Kazakhstan to make its mark on the cultural stage. Nothing gives a country greater publicity than what it can achieve in the cultural sphere, be it music, sport, film, dance, tourism. If Kazakhstan is to be part of the global community, it needs to inspire young people. It needs to work on its cultural assets because the cultural assets are what stir hearts and minds. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Eric, for your input. And uh, there were a number of things we're trying to get your input uh, as a part of a kind of map that we would have, like, shape into a certain report or a certain vision how to solve the problem of, as essentially we think we could tackle SDGs with the partnership between the entrepreneurship, essentially commercializing the research and education that we have. And uh, I thank you for it, especially 
you highlighted that there is a demand for uh, human resources, essentially up to the high level with the both hard skills and soft skills. And you mentioned the, the collaboration with all of the international players, transnational education associations or alliances. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, however, my question is more on the side of the working with the industry. You mentioned that it should be up to the level with the industrial uh, demand. But how you are predicting the integrating working with the industry itself to be uh, both like how you're shaping the demand for the human resources? How, how is it working? Maybe you could share a few things on that side. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's up to me um, or my organization per se to, to dictate or to, to tell people how to arrange themselves. But what I would say is that um, education and industry need to work, uh, as we say in English, hand in glove. I think they need to work together. Um, industry depends on young people coming out of um, uh, an education system, coming out of universities with the skills that industry requires. But equally, universities need uh, or want their students to be um, uh, fit for society and ready to take on employment. So there's a bit of sort of chicken and egg in it. But I think what, what, what my main point would be that industry and um, uh, education need to be working collaboratively and together. Um, nothing is, uh, is, is, is more important, I think, than making sure that what students study at university is relevant to employers, is relevant to the marketplace, and that, um, and it's not just about subject matter, it's also about soft skills. You can be an expert in, in physics or, I don't know, aeronautical engineering or, you know, medical science. But if you don't have the soft skills that go with it to be able to um, engage with other people and um, to, to present any ideas or to lead a team, then I think oftentimes those hard skills, not necessarily wasted, that's probably too strong, but you're, you're, you're better able to communicate those hard skills if you have the soft skills to support them. Uh, many thanks for your uh, opinion, especially on the soft skills. I'm, I'm working more on the side of not academia, but the business, entrepreneurship, and we do need to highlight high mainly soft skills, actually. We believe that hard skills are applied to academia, but the true collaboration between the education and the industry comes through the soft skills, actually. And how it says, if the person is a Nobel Prize winner but can't communicate with another person, it's challenging to become the best team and create a certain output, which is usually a result of not one person, but a group of people working together. Many thanks for your input again. Eric and Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, summarizing with um, the global perspective, it is clear for us that, again, um, education, education and education, and the collaboration with the industry is important. I'm pretty much aware of the creative of our education enterprise program by British Council, which is um, a great example of a, what, what I call a heavy collaboration with the industry, and despite the fact that um, the project, again, it is being done for the um, the higher education in Kazakhstan with the collaboration of the UK universities. Thank you so much. Okay, shall we listen to the local perspective? Um, we've got um, Mr. Chingis Kanapiana from GC Consulting. Um, the floor is yours. And let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that we, we've got um, extreme time um, limits. So, and I'm time giving, by the way. Thank you. Well, thank you, Daniel. That's what I'd like to thank Aliyah and the association for having and organizing this fourth, already fourth uh, conference on sustainable development. What I do see this fourth conference as a continuation of the first Central Asian Sustainable Development Conference that happened and was organized in Almaty in late uh, 19 by Almaty UN Hub and Economic Research Institute of uh, the government of Kazakhstan. The Economic Research Institute is celebrating 60th anniversary this year, so it's maybe one of the oldest 
institutions uh, and research institutions and kind of some economic research institutions and uh, uh, to continue with sustainable developments that institution we did manage to develop the first in Central Asia national sustainable development goals platform that is the platform to unite all uh, government and quasi-governmental authorities as well as to serve the platform for all legal framework development on the sustainable development goals in this country. And they do encourage uh, members of this association to work hand in hand with uh, institution. We have a magazine, a research magazine. We have uh, quite a number of forums and uh, that would link uh, your global experience and your global outlook with some needs that uh, Kazakh authorities and Kazakh governmental bodies uh, do require here. So uh, I would like to encourage you all of you to do that. Out of all 17 goals, I think we have three major goals that are of vital importance in our region. I mean, economic cooperation, like broader and larger economic cooperation within the region, uh, educational development, uh, both hard skills, soft skills, STEM, uh, school development, and the whole spectrum of educational development uh, in this country. And the whole, and the third one, the whole spectrum of ecological issues and ecological development and uh, sustainable development being uh, renewables, uh, green tech, uh, green finance, and all related issues. For economic cooperation, luckily we do have quite a number of uh, supranational platforms that could and should serve the entire region, including Central Asian Trade Forum that will be celebrating 11th uh, anniversary and 11th uh, birthday this year. We have CAREC, an institution uh, organized, run, and funded by ATB that unites all research, researchers and papers in Central Asia, including uh, broader Central Asia, and also how to link businesses. Here at Capitol, we have startup grids, and we support businesses uh, coming out from Capitol. We also helped uh, with that startup grid. Uh, we also helped to establish similar startup engine in our public universities, for example, in Tajikistan. So we are, we are trying and we are spreading knowledge across the region. And for example, how to link businesses and how to link education for each of our 11 departments at KBT, we have industrial councils uh, represented by key leaders uh, like real world businesses, including big four banks, Aerostana, oil and gas companies, petrochemical companies, representing each and every sphere. And they are telling us uh, what to expect from uh, future students, what they're expecting from. Uh, our researchers and we adjust and we plan our um, uh, educational platform and our educational programs with the need of uh, real business, with the needs of uh, uh, larger international companies or operating in the region as well as other companies, of course. And uh, for ecological issues, Kazakhstan became the first country in Central Asia to adopt new ecological code. Uh, it was adopted like months, two months ago. Uh, it's a brand new, with a whole new ideas like polluters should pay more. And uh, for example, for the first time in the region, we established BAT authority, best available technology authority under the ages of the National Green Technologies and Investment Center. So we're trying to absorb all the best experiences from the worldwide and implement them. In, uh, in Kazakhstan, and we are ready to spread that uh, technologies in the region. And of course, uh, your friends and colleagues from association will be uh, very rightly positioned with that VAT uh, uh, body in uh, Astana or anywhere in Kazakhstan. So these are major spectrums, and I do encourage association to work hand in hand with KP2, with Green Technologies Center, and with the Economic Research Institute.
No. Uh, sorry, no. I have a question. Yes. I think I, uh, I mean, I'm fine if uh, Eric or uh, Janice will answer this question, but uh, I know that British Council is doing a lot to, to uh, develop so-called career centers in uh, the Kazakhstan universities and uh, to create this uh, path from school to work transition. And as uh, Sarah mentioned, of course, it's related to some additional skills, which in UK they call employability skills. Yeah. Uh, would you please? Uh, it, of course, here we need research because we need to study the market demand. And unfortunately, we don't have any data about uh, what uh, is marketable skills. Yeah, and what kind of skills we need. And uh, do you see any? Uh, or maybe you will give example of uh, any uh, labor market studies in Kazakhstan, where maybe we have to create some statistics on what kind of uh, skills are required in different regions of Kazakhstan. Because right now we have a tendency that everybody try to go to Almaty or no Sultan because they know about the uh, market demand in these two cities, but we have no idea about other parts of Kazakhstan. So what about this uh, kind of uh, labor market studies? So maybe Economic Research Institute would be better institution to start this kind of open map. Um, and I know that uh, National uh, Chamber of Entrepreneurs, they did a survey, uh, but unfortunately uh, that was only report, but we didn't see any data, uh, the data for the researchers to work on further. So how to make this data available maybe Economic Research Institute can step in on this because we really need this data to know what kind of skills and uh, of the market we need in different regions of Kazakhstan. Thank you. Well, thank you, Medina. Uh, luckily, we do have quite a number of all types of research uh, organized either by some official bodies or by may, many HR agencies called Big Four and many others. There is also uh, Atlas for Future Professions, which is part of a global initiative and it is now available online uh, in Kazakhstan for each and every region, for each and every industry. We also have, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Atomicans report on universities, their grade and their employability, as you rightly mentioned. And uh, of course, there are lots of questions in terms of that report as well as many other reports. But at least it will give you some basic idea on uh, what is needed, on what will be needed. And uh, as I said before, we have industrial councils at Kazakhstan Technical University, for example, and our major partners, they are dictating now. Now, uh, what kind of profession, what kind of skills, uh, what set of skills they will be requiring in, let's say, five, seven years. I just give you an example. One of the major industrial companies deploying a huge industrial project in the uh, western part of Kazakhstan, and they, we work hand in hand with them. Uh, that those spectrum of uh, professions that will be needed. So we are studying, educating KBT uh, uh, students now here, so that uh, well, let's say four or five years they will be already employable all those uh, major projects. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, le local perspective part, um, we would love to listen to Mr. Arthur Van Diesen from UNICEF. Thank you so much. Um, I represent UNICEF, the UN's children's rights organization. It's a great pleasure to be with you um, this afternoon, this morning in the UK. Um, if you ask me about what some of the key bottlenecks are in terms of achieving the SDGs um, in Kazakhstan, I would have to point to the education sector. Uh, so joining very much in what some of my predecessors on this forum um, have been talking about. Now, the focus has been a little bit more on the on higher education in the discussion so far, but I would like to look in a little bit more detail at education at all stages of the life cycle, really starting already with early childhood education. Um, 
in Kazakhstan, we've seen tremendous progress in terms of access to early childhood education. And that's a great uh, step forward because we know that children who have had access to early childhood education actually do much better in the early years of primary school education and throughout um, their school careers. But what is incredibly important as well is that um, that very rapid expansion in early childhood education in Kazakhstan has been based mainly on public-private partnership. So a lot of that expansion has been in the private sector. It's been a good thing, but we are a bit concerned about the quality of early childhood education um, and how we can ensure um, even quality in the early years of, of children's educational journey. So that's a, an agenda still to address when it comes to early childhood education. Then when we turn to primary and secondary education, the, the concerns about quality continue. Um, frankly, I think that is really where the weakest link is um, in Kazakhstan's development story. If we look at um, the PISA results uh, for Kazakhstan, they are well below uh, the OECD averages. Kazakhstan has bold ambitions in terms of becoming one of the 30 richest countries in the, in the world. And it is uh, on track to get there, but education quality is going to hold the country back. That is the big concern. Now, if you look from an investment perspective, Kazakhstan does actually spend a lot of money on educating its children, uh, but it's not getting the returns for that investment that we need to see. Now, this problem with the quality of education at primary and secondary level already existed before COVID-19. COVID-19, of course, made learning all the more complicated in a country like Kazakhstan and, and throughout the world. Of course, government had to close down schools in the, in the last part of the previous academic year simply to control the spread of COVID-19. Um, and then very rapidly, uh, government tried to, uh, to, to move to a system of remote learning. And I have deep respect and a lot of appreciation for government's efforts to make that happen. But this experience also showed some of the cracks in the education system. One of the issues we faced was that really there still is very much a last mile connectivity problem in Kazakhstan even though Kazakhstan has, again, made tremendous progress under the banner of digital Kazakhstan, there are still schools that are not connected. There are still households that are not connected to the internet. And of course, when it comes to learning, we found that there are lots of learners who do not have access to the hardware, the, the devices they need to, um, to, to connect to meaningful learning. So that's one issue, connectivity. Um, content is another issue. Uh, there, is, there are lots of different digital learning platforms um, in Kazakhstan, but they're not necessarily comprehensive. They're not well coordinated between each other, and they're not necessarily suited for those students who are most at risk of being left behind. Uh, thinking, for example, about children with learning difficulties, children with, uh, with disabilities. So content is another issue. And capacity is a third issue we ran into. Capacity on the side of teachers to run remote uh, education satisfactorily. Capacity also on the side of parents to accompany their children in a remote learning journey. And to an extent, but that was not the biggest issue, I think, capacity on the side of pupils as well, in terms of uh, being able to engage meaningfully with a digital learning journey. Now, um, the biggest problem that I see is that uh, COVID had, and, the, and the lockdown and the blended education um, situation we moved into has actually led to learning losses. And the evidence of these learning losses is only now coming to the fore. Um, so we are beginning to see evidence that children have fallen behind quite considerably as a result of school closures um, and, and this whole experience we went through. And the learning losses are uneven. So they're uneven by subject. So we see, for example, that in maths, um, the, the losses are much larger than in some of the other topics. We also see that they're uneven by region and by socioeconomic background. So we really need to understand 
the learning losses that have occurred because there is a catch-up journey that we need to put children on. We need to recover um, the learning losses that have, um, that have occurred. Um, now, I think that actually COVID-19 is also an, an opportunity, is always an opportunity in any kind of disaster scenario. And I think it is an opportunity to truly rethink the education system in Kazakhstan, to make it into a system where uh, learning becomes much more centered on the individual learner. Um, and that we, we actually embrace this blended system of learning and make it work for everyone. That we make sure that the disruptions that happen don't actually end up deepening inequities in the education system. Very final point I will make is just to underline uh, what the colleague from the British Council already said about uh, the importance of the soft skills, uh, the skills to communicate, to problem solve, to work with others, to manage yourself. Um, that is a refrain that comes back over and over again whenever I talk to any business leader in this country. Essentially, young labor market entrants need to be re-educated almost by entrepreneurs to make them ready for the job. And I take it one step further. It's not only about uh, young adults being ready for their role in the labor market. It's also for their role as parents and as citizens of the country. So one final element we really need to address with the, with the Ministry of Education here is skilling of young people. I've seen the, the flag go up, so I will, uh, I will stop here. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valentin. And I think you've raised um, so many um, interesting and insightful, let's say, gaps, perhaps, that should be fulfilled through different mechanisms. I was just wondering, um, would you mind to, to perhaps list um, Projects that UNICEF specifically um, run or propose or offer or whatever, just perhaps to fulfill one of the, those gaps that you've mentioned recently. Thank you. Okay, I'll just, uh, in the interest of time, I'll highlight just two. One is uh, what we call the GIGA initiative, and it's a global initiative which actually started already before COVID-19. Um, and the ambition of that initiative is to connect every single school in the world to broadband internet and every single learner to meaningful digital learning. Um, now, COVID-19 has only strengthened the relevance of that initiative. So what we're looking at is first of all, a mapping of all the schools in the world. That mapping has already been completed for Kazakhstan as well to see which schools are connected and, and not connected to broadband internet. And then also to, to look at the speed of these connections and the reliability of these connections. So we have worked with Kazakhstan on that data and we have a fairly good idea now where the gaps are. Second part is to actually look at innovative financing models to close that connectivity gap. In a country like Kazakhstan, which is so large, of course, the challenge of bringing broadband internet to some of the most remote rural areas is huge. We need new technologies and we need new financing models in order to do that. And with the various government counterparts here, we're trying to engage with that precisely. Final element of the GIGA initiative is precisely around, around digital learning content. So how do we make sure that um, every learner is actually connected to the right set of learning uh, materials, digital learning materials. How do we create these digital public goods, essentially, that don't necessarily need to be national public goods. They can be global public goods that we bring to every learner. So someone referred to that international element of education. I think by going digital, actually, that becomes a lot easier. Second part, second specific program I would highlight to you is um, what we're trying to do in terms of technological innovations to make digital learning easier um, for children with disabilities. So for example, children with visual impairments, children with hearing difficulties, those are children that are in, at particular risk of being left behind when education goes uh, digital and they cannot rely to, uh, on the traditional aids that they were relying on. So here again, working with innovators, working with, uh, with private sector entities, to make that possible, to make it possible for children 
with these uh, learning impairments to actually benefit from a full course of education. That's two um, specific examples that UNICEF is working on in Kazakhstan. Thank you. There is a question from Ambassador. Yeah, I have a quick question uh, for Mr. Van Diesen. Thank you for your presentation. Um, actually, two questions. One, uh, as you said, and all we know, uh, we all know that uh, these uh, education challenges are being experienced by many countries, even developed countries. Um, and uh, even such an issue like access to the hardware uh, is being experienced here in the United Kingdom. There are many complaints. Uh, big families, for example, don't have enough hardware uh, parents is another question, the capacity of the parents. So uh, we even uh, have so many jokes uh, in, the, in the internet about this uh, challenge. But tell, can you tell me uh, what are the most successful countries uh, in this respect and why they are successful, what they have done specifically to make sure that they uh, minimize these uh, challenges? And secondly, my second question is uh, how UNICEF thinks about the future of education? I think. Uh, uh, one thing which uh, we, uh, I think, uh, know now is that uh, even with the end of the pandemic, uh, this digital uh, way of communication will not disappear. Uh, I think uh, the future is for the hybrid uh, form of communication and uh, online uh, uh, connectivity will be crucial uh, because it has so many benefits. Uh, you can cover the whole world, uh, for example, for, for a physical conference, you wouldn't dream to bring someone from the United States, for example, or Australia. Online, you can easily get uh, everyone from different corners of the world. So uh, do you have any plans as the UN uh, family organization to uh, uh, kind of uh, prepare the world for the post-pandemic uh, in terms of perfecting the hybrid ways of uh, communicating, uh, helping people to communicate? Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for two uh, very useful questions and, and interesting questions. And uh, we could speak for a very long time about both these questions. On the first one, in terms of uh, international experience, without going into great detail, I think the countries that have been more successful are countries that have been really realistic about their capacities. Um, there are countries that have been too confident that they could go fully digital, um, and they have fallen down. Um, now, the, the countries that have been more successful have taken a much more realistic view on what is possible given the existing, existing infrastructure, given uh, the level of capacity of, of students, giving access to devices, and have found a, a combination of different learning pathways. So yes, online, where it is possible to go online, uh, through TV, through radio, face-to-face um, -face where it's safe to do so. So those blended approaches really have been, um, have been most successful. And it links actually to the second question. I, I absolutely agree with you that blended learning is, is here to stay. Um, it provides huge advantages. Um, and um, I think what is really important, the, the key concept I think to the future of ed education is to develop multiple pathways to learning that are really suited to individual learners. Because if you look at individual learners, and I'm, of course, from a UNICEF perspective, mainly talk, mainly talk about children here, right? primary and secondary education. Every child comes with specific talents, with specific abilities, and with specific um, shortcomings and, and, and special needs. So really, the, the situation we're in now, where we're developing different pathways to learning, is also one that allows us to become much more individual in our approach to the needs of individual um, learners. Um, and I think that is absolutely the key. But that, that really um, is a complete reimagination of, of the education system, right? That's a, that's a revolution. It's no longer um, students in a classroom and you fill them as empty containers with, with, with knowledge. No, it's really taking every individual and recognizing that levels of ability differ and therefore educational approaches need to differ as well. And the technology we now have at our fingertips, as long as we get everyone connected, um, actually facilitates that kind of approach. Totally agree with you that the international element becomes so much easier, getting adolescents to speak um, across the boundaries. I mean, we're still in a, in a region uh, that is blessed by having a, a, a lingua franca, 
right? So we can easily connect the countries in the former Soviet Union um, and, and start developing common uh, uh, kind of public goods, public learning goods that can be shared across countries much more than they're being, uh, than they're being done now. Thank you. Quickly uh, to the countries, uh, so specific, whether Germany, Sweden, where uh, we should send our delegations to learn. <laughs> I, I'll need to get back to you. I need to consult with my with my education <laughs> specialist on that. I don't uh, want you, to stick my neck out on that one. You're diplomatic, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a diplomat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we've got um, a guest from Asian Development Bank, Mr. Gennady Rao. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, colleagues, and uh, thank you. Uh, I apologize, I'm a little bit sick. Uh, like uh, the weather in Almaty is very unpredictable. Last week we had like plus 15, now it's below zero, like, and uh, I get a little bit affected. So, yeah. of course, so I cannot uh, attend it uh, in person at uh, Kazakhstan British Technical University. So, it's actually my intervention uh, nicely fits uh, into a Van Dyssen speech. Uh, he was uh, talking about the role of education and I would like to talk about the research and development. And uh, I would like to tell, uh, tell you that I'm a country economist for Kazakhstan at Asian Development Bank. So I analyze the uh, economic situation in Kazakhstan is development. And what I observe as a country economist is that I see that uh, Kazakhstan uh, emerges from crisis every time, but the level and the speed of the uh, development is slower. For example, we have like uh, the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Before financial crisis, the economy of Kazakhstan and Central Asia was growing on average around 10%, more than 9%, the average growth from 2000 to 2007. After uh, that crisis from 2010 to 2013, we see that the growth level has reduced to 5% on average. After that, from 2016 to 2019, in 2015, we had like the oil price commodities collapse. Uh, and we see that the economy was growing around 4%. Now, when we look further in the future, we suspect that the economy might grow even slower than that, around 3%. That is the predictions for the medium term growth for Kazakhstan. And that's why, uh, I'm uh, talking about the innovation. Uh, the reason why Kazakhstan's economy is not growing as fast as it could uh, after each crisis is that uh, it's a very, uh, it has a lot of uh, dependence on commodities and uh, the growth is driven by commodities and uh, there's a so-called uh, limited uh, uh, creative destruction in the economy happening. Uh, we see it uh, all the time. And uh, this creative destruction is usually driven by innovation uh, in the economy. Economy usually innovates itself, but in Kazakhstan, uh, the spending on innovation, it's very low. Uh, I uh, can reference to you like the figures for 2019, Kazakhstan spent uh, just 0.12% of GDP on innovation, on research and development. For example, uh, many developed countries are spending around two or three percent of GDP. And if we uh, look at that figure over time, like for example, the past decade, that actually spending declined. We used to spend 0.25 percent of GDP decade ago on innovation, research and development. And now it's half of that in terms of GDP, but it increased in nominal terms, but in uh, relative terms, it declined. And it's actually very worrisome to us that uh, when we are talking about innovation, yes, we see some bright examples of Nazarbayev University or K Kazakh British Technical University, but overall, the whole system of innovation in Kazakhstan, it's in a very precarious situation. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it cannot supply uh, good solutions for the government uh, for business to grow. When we also, another issue is that, uh, uh, I have, I see two issues. The, the spending uh, on innovation, it's a uh, uh, one very important issue, but uh, why it is so low? Uh, I see uh, two reasons. Uh, first of all, it's government spending. It's very low. Uh, we see that, uh, for example, uh, government spends uh, very limited funds on innovation. 
Uh, moreover, government had uh, its own targets. For example, when strategic plan 2020 was adopted or strategic plan 2025 was adopted for Kazakhstan, in those plans, there was a target of investing 1% of GDP on innovation, and it was not achieved. Government never achieved that target. And there is no credible plan to achieve. So as I mentioned, like 0.12%, in order for us to achieve that 1% target, we need to increase the spending 10 times overnight. And that's really impossible. It's impossible in terms of the capacity and uh, in terms of the funding available for the government. Another issue is that businesses are not spending on innovative activity. In Kazakhstan, we see that businesses invest, uh, when we look at the structure of uh, research and development spending, less than half, around 45% of spending on research and development is coming from the private sector. More than half is actually from government. And that's unusual situation in many developed countries, 70, 80% of innovative spending is coming from the businesses. And this has to do with some rigidity in our uh, rules in Kazakhstan, for example, in order for a company to get a tax credit on innovative spending, it needs to prove that it was applied, there was a patent application, and there's a lot of this red tape, and many companies just don't uh, proceed with spending on innovation. Uh, but also, there is a lack of innovative environment in Kazakhstan. They do not know where to invest into innovation. And uh, they, uh, for example, uh, all of you know that uh, President Nazarbayev tasked uh, many uh, firms in oil industry to spend 1% of their uh, revenue on innovation. And what ended up happening is that many of those firms, they were asking like for different uh, reclassification. For example, they build a school, which is also needed investment, but then they ask it to count as innovation or they spend on other means or something else and they ask it to count as innovation. So those uh, very creative ways of avoiding the rule uh, helps to explain why there's very limited private funding of innovative activity as well. So uh, I see that uh, my time is running up. So uh, I uh, would like to say that uh, development partners are happy to help Kazakhstan. We provided a loan uh, for the government uh, in 2020, for example, we provided 1 billion US dollar loan, uh, counter-cyclical loan to help a government to uh, adjust to the COVID-19 reality. We also provided more than 3 million US dollars in grants to the government of Kazakhstan. For example, one of the grants was for very innovative product. We helped uh, Kazakh, uh, uh, Kazakh IT developers to produce a COVID-19 web application, which helped to the Ministry of Health to track the COVID-19 patients, uh, to, to develop the map of their contact persons and uh, to monitor the situation. So we are ready to help, but I think that government needs to become serious about innovation if it wants to propel the growth of the country in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Um, thank you for such an insightful speech. Um, I think I've got some questions and I want to take advantage of being a moderator here and might be very egoistic here by asking it, but um, my message is, well, we're ready to supply. Apart from financing that you've mentioned, that should be leveraged, definitely. And I definitely agree with that. And I think most of us um, are okay. What about the role of human capital here? Specifically, if you look at, just let me give a case um, of the association. We've got a plenty of people having, um, you know, a, a fundamental expertise in a specific topics. <clears throat> so, and we are, we are partnering with support institutions that actually are creating what we call innovative ecosystem or innovative environment. Um, what, 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 what do you think about the role of science, young talents, that's young um, scientists, okay, or PhD students, or just fellows, and um, perhaps solving or helping to uh, deal with the challenges that you've mentioned so far? Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, for your question. Uh, so um, I think that it's a, uh, 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 it's a step in the right direction. Uh, like, for example, 
we all know what was happening uh, in early 2000 in Kazakhstan when uh, we had like a really diploma mill in terms of uh, like uh, when a uh, candidate of science was given to almost uh, uh, anyone. And then those uh, councils were closed. And now the rules of getting like a PhD degree are very strict. They actually stricter than abroad. I have a, uh, uh, I have a, a good friend of mine. He, he's actually giving a speech like uh, maybe uh, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, Ilyas. He's a, a student in the UK. And, uh, and I have another uh, friend of mine who is uh, studying uh, in Kazakhstan. And the rules for him to study PhD in UK are uh, more relaxed than here in Kazakhstan. Here in Kazakhstan, you have to have like two supervisors, uh, one from abroad, one from Kazakhstan. You have to publish in impact factor journals. So the rules are really strict. And uh, they are in the right direction in the sense that we need to have a very strong candidate. But uh, by making such strict rules, we have very limited supply of PhD. Now uh, we have very, so uh, we are uh, having like this issue of that uh, overall, the system is becoming like starving. There is no many researchers. As I mentioned, we spend very little amount on R&D and also, we have less than 22,000 people who are engaged into R&D. That's also a very small number of researchers as well. So uh, I think uh, government needs to uh, somehow like uh, increase the spending on uh, research and development, as well as expand the number of researchers. Because like when you have more researchers, you have more competition, you have uh, more publications, uh, better environment, more debate, because like if you have very limited number of researchers, even though they may be very high caliber, but uh, still uh, uh, there will be a very limited number of opinions at the end of the day. So I think uh, there's some room for improvement. Uh, government uh, did uh, right things uh, in uh, mid 2000 uh, by closing that, uh, uh, by stripping the rules. But now we need another step uh, to, uh, uh, increase the number of researchers and funding for research and development. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. I was just a bit expecting you to perhaps position um, the role of, sorry, a, uh, Asian Development Bank. How do you want to collaborate with um, a firm research fellows, um, PhD students, and researchers? Again, you mentioned some very nice solutions that ATB already are sort of implementing. Um, would you say that the role of, again, young researchers was crucial here, or um, there is nothing to say about that? I'm asking you because we do see a challenge of, um, you know, when a, a, a doctoral researcher has a great solution or a research project, but unfortunately, um, the part of commercializing it or monetizing it really you know, um, let's say. Yeah, I understood you. Uh, so talking about Asian Development Bank, uh, I can honestly tell you that uh, most of our funding, it comes to infrastructure. We are uh, like a uh, very old uh, bank, which uh, funds like very big projects, like for example, Western uh, Europe, uh, Western Asia, like this highway, like Western China. So uh, yes, um, majority is like hardcore infrastructure, but we are modernizing and we're trying to fund more like, uh, not like research per se, but digital technologies and other areas. And uh, here we see an issue. Uh, and the issue is that uh, it's difficult to find uh, really good uh, local uh, talented uh, young people. Uh, <clears throat> we see that, uh, uh, the uh, foreign solutions often are uh, better. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, sometimes come cheaper. And uh, we know that we need to help to develop a Kazakhstan a local grown solution. And we try to invest in local talent. But it's not easy, to be honest. And uh, we uh, run through, for example, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, for example, to hire consultants for that uh, application, web application, 
We had to organize. Uh... <coughs> Sorry, am I losing some water? Uh, we had to organize a competition uh, among uh, talented uh, uh, young IT de uh, developers. It was a hackathon. And uh, in that hackathon, we had the Ministry of Digital Development, which was looking at different solutions and uh, told us which one is the most relevant in their opinion. So that was our uh, approach. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we've got a question. Anna, um, this can be so just a quick one. Gennady, I think it would be good and helpful if you would be able to connect the uh, association, PhD association with uh, ADB Skarek Institute in the Western China uh, with uh, ADB Publications Unit that is not only limited to ADB stuff, but uh, is able to attract a wider audience. And I think you can also share maybe later uh, with the association uh, uh, ADB's uh, research scholarships. I think that could be also helpful. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you are correct. We have uh, within ADB, uh, we have like so called like ADB family. We have uh, Karak Institute and also ADB Institute, which is located in Tokyo, as you mentioned. Uh, they uh, engaged into research more than us, actually. We are a resident office which uh, serves the government, and we're uh, we interacting with the government in terms of loans and grants. And not so much in terms of the research. Uh, I will be happy to share uh, contacts of my colleagues offline with you. Please uh, let me know which topics of interest for you, which uh, <coughs> researches might be of interest for you. I will be happy to assist you with that. Thank you. Uh, also, please let me remind you that we've got a, a white blackboard here and we're fixing everything. So to create a report, finally, uh, well, we will finish the, this sessions. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is the end of uh, uh, session two, but we've got expert comments and questions from um, C. Yeah, I believe I have the common question maybe to all of our participants. Uh, and the question is the following. Uh, um, I heard a really comment from Kinadi regarding the support of the innovation of IMT and coming from the business background, I would say that I am investing more than 1% in IMT and, and innovations. But for me, the issue is not to provide the money, but um, the issue is whom I should give it. When I'm coming to university, they say, okay, here's the research. But as a, a business uh, entity, I don't need research, I need a solution to my problems. And for me, the biggest type of problem in Kazakhstan, which I face as the financial financer of RD, is what is in between, what is the agent that will adapt maybe an involved university, and whom I should give money to get the solution for my problems. Maybe you could highlight some ideas, because this is a problem more local, but maybe you could provide some insights of more international solutions that you have met or uh, some additional ways to solve it here in Kazakhstan. Thank you. It's actually a question to all the participants, but maybe uh, any person could answer on their behalf. I believe I can, we can start from development banks because uh, they have more experience maybe on that side and then for the because it's part of the infrastructure in my opinion. Well, there is an IT garden based in uh, Almaty and they are official one of the recipients of that 1% uh, research uh, coming from all of the mining uh, companies. So I think it would be good to get in touch with them and uh, establish some. They also have uh, all types of opportunities, both for research and for business uh, incubators. So I think it would be good to get in touch with them. Yeah. Many thanks for your replies, but uh, the question is here more about the mechanism overall. Like, 
I understand that there is a tech argument, uh, but it is mainly uh, or focused on the mining, and I'm not part of the commodities business. I'm more into the intellectual services and which and uh, um, essentially I'm from an IT background. I'm working with the startups and working with the intellectual property mainly. Maybe you would highlight the innovation in that side more because the commodities are more, let's say, well established and R&D centers are there uh, are rather established, like well developed too, especially with the national com uh, companies and the tech and, and similar organizations, both governmental and non-governmental. Any comments on the mechanisms, ladies and gentlemen? We've got some comments in the chat. I think all those mechanisms are well stipulated in uh, the law, but just go to back to the basics and see the law. We've got a comment from Alpamis Asabayev. So there seems to be a correlation between number of researchers and the amount of GDP spent on R&D. Um, that was a question. So on the other hand, Mr. Rao stated that the quantity does not produce quality. Thank you, Alpamis, for your comment. Okay, so no, there are no comments, so we can summarize. Finally, um, our wonderful, mysterious white blackboard. Thank you so much for everyone who um, shared with their insights and, and expert opinions. Yeah. Shall we summarize uh, and get maybe key points from what we've learned during the sessions? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh... Just as a short summary, I believe there were a few inputs, and I here would like not to highlight uh, all the participants individually, but say general problems that we have uh, highlighted during this session. I believe there was uh, a comment made by uh, Harry that there is a high demand for HR, which is uh, essential, and uh, the issue is here having sufficient both. Not only hard skills, which is knowledge, but soft skills too. Uh, the second thing, and I believe ATP has highlighted that one, saying that the soft skills are more or less essential in work. Um, and there was another comment that education is the mechanism for solving these soft skills, but it's a bit lagging maybe in Kazakhstan at the moment. And I believe Latina has uh, provided her question regarding this employability of the search for another. Problem that was highlighted is there was, there is a cooperation between universities and industry, uh, but it is to be frank on my side, I think here what's the best solution besides just talking to the associations and uh, industrial companies. Uh, actually, here my example would be good cooperation is Mercedes uh, Mercedes University Mercedes company. They have created a platform where you could uh, there listing all the problems and you can provide your solution and once you provide your solution you can get money out of it which is the government Mercedes is essentially uh, developing this procedure through the digitalization and this is another topic that was raised during the uh, discussion that we had that digitalization of education is uh, very important problem, not a problem, but a thing that requires a solution. It's not challenging. Yes. Um, and the last ones that were coming is a good education uh, that uh, uh, was especially for the early uh, stages of development. So we need to have, we have quite well developed uh, late education, say with the universities, PhDs, but the question is more on the early side with the Maybe from the kindergarten up to the high school. 
maybe probably somewhere is there too, as uh, it was mentioned that the level of education, especially with the COVID impact, shows that there are certain gaps in education and uh, which requires being solved. And the last one that was mentioned, I believe, is specifically highlighted by Gennady uh, for the full duration of his speech that R&D is a good mechanism of developing and fostering a high economic growth. Uh, and uh, he highlighted that there is uh, ADP loans being provided, but here the government is the main actor to take part in fostering this development. Uh, there were some other initiatives regarding the financing, how those problems are being solved at the moment. Uh, I believe the more clear one that at least I have identified on my side is the ADP's uh, uh, initiative regarding the, the direct mechanisms, which is the loans. And the grants, and I believe thanks to Julius, he has highlighted that uh, ATP is a much bigger family that could provide actually much more uh, input on the side of solving this problem. And another one that was provided by the UCF uh, uh, representative is the GIGA initiative, which is very interesting. And we will dig, dig deeper in that one, especially regarding the content adaptation, which is, I believe, one of the essential problems that we could help. On our side, with the expertise uh, from the associations and our support as an international financing and making it as a sustainable digital platform and solution. This is, uh, we believe that this way of going from the uh, problems through the financing and solutions will be uh, an outcome that we want to receive. Uh, another, uh, I believe, here is some of the things that we have heard from the side of the suppliers. Or the people who are involved in this process is mainly universities, um, some involvement with the big four or some research institutions, like uh, economic research institutions uh, that Chinese has provided the insight. And uh, on the side of the education here, I just mentioned the schools and the digital platforms. So we can see that uh, now it's not only universities. Are the only sole recipient of the education process, but the markets too. And digitalization is happening, ha helping that. Side. And a few of the things that were mentioned, we I believe there are good outcomes or results that could be used in our work as the ways of solving it. Essentially, the global network. And that's what we're trying to uh, tackle here with the getting all of the experience around the world trying to solve and essentially scale the experience of our countries. Uh, there were a few, rather than seeing negative, but a few issues that are alarming and we need to tackle on is the low level of innovation, especially with the business. And I believe the uh, United specifically stated that mainly the case for the market companies with the region process. Um, it's a problem that I believe we'll be raising tomorrow with our uh, government representative uh, participants of the board. Another thing that we already highlighted is that the researchers are another way of uh, solving the problems. I believe Genius has highlighted this through the provision of the uh, researches that would be a bridge between university and market uh, with like big four or research institutions. And we believe that. We will get that deeper in that side, maybe because an issue of uh, accessibility of data is an issue. Maybe we could somehow make it more, we'll try to come up with at least a certain mechanism to share uh, without that going into other commercial uh, secrets. The last three things that here I would highlight is that education problem itself, especially with the content or early stages. And especially and another factor with the skills, soft skills specifically, is to be added in the process. And I believe tomorrow we will raise this question with the Ministry of uh, Education. And another two issues is, of course, the infrastructure issues. Um, those are present everywhere. We will get the input from the government on that side. And the blended learning, which is, the, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, essentially, what was mentioned is the future of education is developing individual education for every person. And it's not only for 
but people with certain difficulties, but any person, because the educational process, uh, process itself is uh, rather challenging and individual. And uh, maybe digitalization could be one of the ways of uh, solving this problem, especially the hybrid education. Those are the few things. Uh, please don't be very uh, strict on us and um, because we want to get the input of all the various stakeholders to see the full picture, how we see the problems and solutions, and through our this prism of uh, research and development, how could we solve uh, problems of SDG specifically, or uh, the, maybe economic uh, development or, uh, as a whole, the some of the big things. Uh, yeah, can be good. Yes, well, that's the draft of the draft of our, yeah, thanks so much for the picture. I would like to mention some stuff uh, about the ecosystem and, and to position the association. The association is very much ready with the capacity and expertise to help to tackle the challenge that we've just raised um, with you, uh, dear participants. So thank you so much for um, being with us today and, and sharing with the very much insightful information. We do appreciate it and we'll definitely summarize everything and we'll um, sort of create, design a report. Um, so while well, we still have tomorrow and we, we, we've got, perhaps we'll have a different picture um, with the government representatives that really position differently everything. So again, thank you so much uh, for being with us and having us. Alia, please. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, participants, attendees, dear moderators, for uh, leading this session today. I think it was a fruitful uh, conversation, which gave us a lot of insights to move forward and taking into account your ideas, your experience, and develop joint uh, mechanism. So we have actually idea to set up a joint venture in near future with six stars uh, to pilot all these mechanisms. Uh, that's why it's so important uh, to have all this uh, insight from you. Uh, should we have any last comments from all of these? Yes, please, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got time. Please, uh, any comments? Yes, I would like to say I wrote to the chat. Uh, I think uh, uh, if we are concluding, I just want to thank once again everyone. I would like uh, uh, again uh, to commend our association, uh, PSG Association. Uh, I think uh, uh, you show uh, uh, the stamina, the capacity. I would strongly recommend that uh, you, when you face some red tape, which is inevitable uh, anywhere, including in Kazakhstan, unfortunately, if you face uh, such things, do not drop your hands, continue to persevere, uh, and uh, uh, keep your minds uh, very clear with your goals and targets. Uh, as far as the embassy is concerned, you know that uh, you always have our support. And I would uh, also uh, make a practical call and request uh, uh, to our international partners, uh, particularly from the UN family, uh, from ADB, EBRD, uh, others who participated today, please do uh, support a PhD association. Uh, this, uh, this is a trustworthy uh, a group of young, energetic, dedicated, uh, uh, people, and I strongly recommend them. Uh, I hope, Aliyah, you will have follow-up meetings with uh, those organizations to talk about uh, uh, joint steps in terms of uh, uh, connecting and bridging science and industry, uh, commercialization, uh, uh, the uh, scientific research, and many other topics uh, which you will be discussing over the five days. I will repeat this call tomorrow to the uh, Kazakh state bodies uh, on a uh, on, on a specially uh, elevated level. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I can see the response from the international partners and I thank you for your response. And I hope that uh, all uh, things which we have discussed will be uh, translated into practical uh, things between you and the uh, uh, association. By the way, uh, in English, associations uh, abbreviation seems very nice, uh, K-P-A-U-K. But if you read it in from Russian, it, it sounds like a pauk or spider. But uh, I think uh, it's a very good uh, coincidence, Alia, because you, like spiders, uh, should uh, spread your uh, tentacles uh, 
uh, uh, and cover as much space as possible. So it's, it's, it's very relevant, I think, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, reflection. Once again, thank you very much. I wish you a very good uh, coming five days. And of course, uh, I wish you uh, a very successful uh, celebration year for Kazakhstan. We will have so many events. Uh, we plan so many events in the embassy. Uh, uh, hopefully, the uh, situation in London will be improving. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll be uh, active online with Aliyah. We are doing, again, a traditional job fair this coming Saturday. Uh, so many things are coming by. And uh, finally, I'd like to uh, wish everyone a happy Nowruz. Uh, yesterday, in Western Kazakhstan, Nowruz uh, has started. Uh, in Western Kazakhstan, we have a separate holiday called Kuru uh, Sukhana. So when people embrace each other. So the Nowruz started its march uh, throughout Kazakhstan. Uh, as you know, Nowruz is the symbol of... Uh, rejuvenation, symbol of new life. So I wish you uh, every, every uh, success in Nauris and a very successful planting of new seeds for future, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, um, Mr. Ali Glory, would you like to say last words? Thank you very much. Put me on the spot. Put me on the spot there. Um, yeah, sure. I think you know. I think um, as an international partner, as I, as I'm being described, um, I think this is very um, uh, exciting forum that you've created. Um, I think it's actually very uh, innovative of you to actually have pulled this all together and. Uh, I would just say, don't lose the momentum, keep it going. Um, I think the hybrid uh, way of doing this seems to have worked quite well. And, um, you know, keep going, I would say, keep the discussion uh, going and, and um, feed anything that comes out of this uh, to us and just keep that dialogue fluid. But I think this is absolutely wonderful. So congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. Chinggis, please, just a quick one. Keep not just discussion going, but do keep all the practical implementation going, which is much more important. Thank you. We'll try to make it work. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, and let me remind you that this is the full Central Asian Research Forum on Sustainable Development in Innovation 2021. We wish you good luck 